I want to welcome everyone to yet another seminar in the Let's Talk Plot series. Uh, we have had over 18 so far, which is astonishing. They've all been free, all paid for by Thrombosis UK. And I think we've covered almost every area of venous thromboembolism. We have one left tomorrow, uh, which is looking at VTE and pregnancy led by Charlotte Free. So if you want to update yourself in that area, please do sign on tomorrow. Uh, just register and it will be free. Uh, but for me, this is a really exciting session. It's on vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, uh, where the UK has played a major role in defining uh, the condition and also uh, improving care. And we have a stellar cast of speakers uh, and we're going to go through all areas of fit, and then there will be quarter of an hour at the end for questions. Hopefully we'll cover almost everything, but if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat box uh, and, and we can cover them there. So uh, in the UK, uh, we had a, a group, a core group, uh, an expert hematology panel made up of Professor Mike Macris, uh, Marie Scully, Sue Patvard, myself and Will Lester. Will Lester isn't with us today because he did a really good talk uh, on non-heparin-based anticoagulation uh, earlier in the week. But to start us off, uh, I'm going to ask Professor Mike Macris to talk to us about VT timeline instance and risk factors. I think we all know Mike very well. He is uh, our Twitter star. He has a massive following on Twitter. He's brilliant on all aspects of COVID, especially on thrombosis. He also happens to be Professor of Hemostasis and Thrombosis at the University of Sheffield and an honorary consultant hematologist at the Sheffield Teaching Hospitals Trust. He's a past president of the European Association for Haemophilia uh, and he's a member of the ISTH Council. Mike, over to you. Really looking forward to your talk. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation to give this talk. Um, as you heard, I'm going to talk about vaccine-induced immune thrombostopenia and thrombosis. I have no interest to declare for this uh, presentation. Unless you've been asleep for the last couple of years, you will know that we've had a huge number of cases of COVID worldwide and the UK, for many reasons, you will know, has disproportionate number of cases and deaths from the condition. These are the data from yesterday. Um, as you can see, the UK is still having 42,000 cases of COVID per day, which is, to me, is amazing. What, uh, what is changing worldwide is that the world is getting vaccinated. And this is the data downloaded this morning from Bloomberg, excellent site about the number of vaccinations. And what you see is that more than 6.6 .6 billion doses of um, COVID vaccines have been given worldwide. And um, essentially, uh, the more green the map, the more doses have been given. So many countries are quite green, but there are many, especially in Africa, where very little vaccination has taken place. This is a, a timeline re relevant to the talk today. And um, I've tried to limit the information I put on, otherwise it becomes difficult to follow. And it essentially relates to the AstraZeneca vaccination. In the UK, the approval for the AstraZeneca vaccine came just after Christmas and vaccination in the UK started in the first week in January. A month after the UK approved the AstraZeneca vaccine, the European Medicines Agency um, approved it for use in Europe. And we now then subsequently go to the middle of March 2021 
when um, the syndrome of Zvit was announced by three groups in, uh, uh, in the UK, in Germany, and in Norway. It took uh, about two to three weeks later for the uh, regulators in the UK and Europe to announce that this new syndrome of thrombosis, thrombocytopenia and particular factor antibody, factor four antibodies was um, real. And at that stage in the UK, they advised restriction of the AstraZeneca vaccine for the less than 30 year olds. And uh, a month later, the age restriction was reduced, was increased to less than 40 year olds. Um, it's difficult to give this talk at this stage without telling you what VIT is. So I'm going to have this single slide and I'm sure uh, the subsequent speakers will come back to this. So VIT occurs five to 30 days after vaccination with one of the COVID-19 vaccines, um, consists of thrombosis, low platelets, high D-dimer, especially more than 4,000. The normal D-dimer level is less than 500 and the presence of antiplatelet factor four antibodies. Um, if you have all five criteria, then you're definite. And if you have just um, high D-dimer plus three criteria, then it's probable. This is what's um, happened in the UK. We start on the 1st of January on the left-hand side and we go, uh, we come back in time. And as you can see, the peak here shows the number of cases of VIT that were occurring in the UK by the date and by the date of vaccination in blue, by the date of admission to hospital in red. And as you can see, our really bad time and difficult time for uh, the UK and our group was at the start of April this year, when we had almost 40 cases um, of um, VIT per week. Now, um, to appreciate the data that I'm going to be showing you, you need to know about the uh, different names. There are two names that you need to be aware of. There is one name called TTS, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, that is used by regulators because they don't want to ascribe relation to the vaccination. However, most uh, people working in this area, most hematologists use the term VIT. V-A-T-T -T and V-I-P-I-T are no longer used and you can forget about them. So we need to remember VIT and TTS. And there are two versions of VIT. One of them is uh, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia and one is thrombocytopenia with thrombosis at the end. And that was just to avoid the con confusion with another condition in hematology called um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So to appreciate the difference between TTS and VIT, I'm showing you this graph. So TTS, thrombocytopenic syndrome, yes, many of the VIT cases are there, as you show, see in the middle, but TTS, you can have it due to cancer, to the conditions called TTP, CAPS, DIC. So if you got vaccinated and you have cancer causing low platelets and thrombosis, it's counted as TTS, even though it's not VIT. And also with VIT, you um, have um, a, a related condition called pre-VIT. And increasingly, when you got better at this and when it was announced to the population that this existed, we got more cases of pre-VIT. And pre-VIT means you got the symptom, most of the features like severe headache, low platelets, antiplatelet factor four antibodies, but no thrombosis. And there is a paper from Germany that shows that if you present to hospital with pre-VIT and you don't get treated like VIT, you go on to get thrombosis, especially cerebral vein thrombosis. So it's very real, it's part of the same syndrome and it's just the first stage of the syndrome. So the conclusion from all this is that 
not all cases of TTS are VIT, and not all cases of VIT are TTS. So that's quite an important point to make. So what are they, what is the incidence of VIT in, in the UK? VIT is in inverted commas here because strictly this should be TTS because this data from the regulators, the MHRA. So if you receive your first AstraZeneca vaccine, the incidence, if you are over the age of 50 is one in a hundred thousand. If you're under the age of 50 is one in 50,000. The MHRA claim that you can have it after a second dose, which is a frequency of about um, one in 500,000. But I'm personally skeptical whether these are true VIT cases. The um, highest rates of VIT are from Norway. And on this occasion, they are true VIT cases. In Norway, when the AstraZeneca vaccine became available, it was the first one available, and they decided to vaccinate all their young healthcare workers, which most of whom were nurses. And as you can see, they gave 132,000 vaccinations and over 100,000 were uh, female. And what they saw was eight cases of VIT with five deaths. And the rate in Norway, which is the highest reported by anybody so far, is uh, the case rate is one in 16,000 and the death rate is one in 26,000, which is quite high. The question is whether it's rare in Asians. The AstraZeneca vaccination is now being increasingly used in Asia. And there are two publications, uh, one from South Korea suggesting that the incidence is one in eight million and in Taiwan about one in half a million, which obviously it's much rarer. I have also seen unpublished information so far that suggests in other countries in Asia is halfway between these two figures. So all the publications from Asia are pointing to the same um, fact that it is rarer in Asians. And that's not so surprising because a related condition called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is much rarer in Asians. Sorry about this, I'm having some difficulty moving my slides so, and it's skipping. So VIT or TTS strictly also occurs after the Johnson & Johnson vaccination. This is not used in the UK, but this is one that is used as a single vaccine. In the UK, the, it's, or in the US when it's widely used, it's one in 300,000 cases. Um, this has also been used in Denmark but they stopped using it after their rate of VIT, after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is one in 45,000. These are the official data from the MHRA. They are released every week and um, they are due to be released again this afternoon. So these are from last Thursday. As you can say, these are the TTS or thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome data, 421 cases with AstraZeneca, and it is claimed 18 cases with Pfizer and two with Moderna. And as you can see at the very bottom, um, 375 of the AstraZeneca cases are after the first dose and 46 after the second dose. The MHRA also give data on um, the number uh, broken down by age. And as you can see, the number of cases in the middle and the number of persons that died on the right. So overall, 17% of the patients died. What you mustn't conclude from this is that the highest risk rate, uh, age group is 40 to 49, because this is the UK stopped vaccinating under the age of 40. So what we really need is the rate for each age group. But unfortunately, despite all our attempts to get the data of how many persons received the first AstraZeneca vaccine by a decade of age, we have failed. So I cannot show you that data.
So I'll end up by discussing uh, who is at increased risk for VIT. Essentially, it's if you have AstraZeneca or J Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It doesn't appear to be an increased risk with Pfizer or Moderna vaccinations. It is a higher risk with the first dose, and it's a higher risk in younger persons. There is a question mark there about European ethnic origin. I'm personally getting more convinced now that there is an ethnic difference between the groups in view of the data coming from Asia now. So who is not at risk of VIT? Um, I put there women because we believe the risk in women is the same as men. The reason Norway and Germany reported a higher risk uh, initially in women is because they vaccinated more women because they concentrated in vaccinating young healthcare professionals. We looked at the data from the UK and thrombophilia, previous thrombosis, antiphospholipid syndrome, autoimmune disorders, comorbidities, contraceptive pill usage was not really higher than what we expected. There's a question mark whether persons who have had a VIT with the first dose will have a higher risk when they get their second dose, or persons who have this related condition called heparin-induced thrombostopenia are going to be at increased risk. Um, all persons in these groups are advised not to have the AstraZeneca vaccine, but um, the evidence that they're at increased risk if exposed uh, further is unclear. So that was my last slide. And if you want to be updated about um, VIT, you can uh, follow me on Twitter because I tweet quite a lot about VIT. And thank you, that is my presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. You have covered every possible aspect of instance and that, that absolutely amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, and I would encourage everyone listening to follow Mike on Twitter. He's extraordinary. I don't believe he sleeps, actually. He's always <laughs> tweeting. So there we go. Um, I'm going to keep all the questions to the end. I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Professor Beverly Hunt uh, and I'm Medical Director of Thrombosis UK. Uh, we're moving on to our second speaker who I think almost everybody will know. Uh, that's Professor Marie Scully and she's going to talk about presentation and laboratory testing of VIT. She's a consultant hematologist at University College Hospital uh, London uh, and also Professor of Thrombosis and Hemostasis at UCL. Uh, she's got particular interests in platelet-mediated disorders, specifically ITP, TTP, uh, and acquired uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, and acquired bleeding and thrombotic conditions. She's the national lead for TTP. Uh, she's very involved with the patients, and she's pa patron for the TTP network. Uh, and in the last Queen's birthday honours list, she got an MBE for that work. Uh, she's involved in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching uh, and regularly reviews for most of the haematology journals. So Marie, we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Beverly and Joe, for the invitation to present today as part of Thrombosis UK, but also World Thrombosis Day. So my title for the next 20 minutes or so is Presentation and Laboratory Testing of VIT. And Mike's given a fantastic overview, as Beverly has said, but I thought it might be useful to start with a case so that you get a feel for uh, the type of presentations that the UK were exposed to early on in relation to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So this was a case of a 23 year old young man who'd been completely fit and well. He received the AstraZeneca vaccine on the 18th of March. So that's very early, a la the grades with regards to age range for rollout of the vaccine. And the reason he got it early, as is often the case for younger people, is if there's any vaccine that was left at the end of the day, it was used 
uh, for anyone that was available. And this particular young man's mum worked within a GP centre. So that's the right thing to do. We don't want to waste it. Um, but it was very early on in the identification of this condition. He then presented to one of our local uh, EDs at the end of March, so about 12 days later, and had been very, very confused for the previous 24 hours and had evidence of right-sided weakness or stroke. Having preceded this was four days history of really severe headache and vomiting, out of the blue, nothing he's ever had before. So at presentation, his platelet count was reduced to 22,000. He had evidence of a stroke and had a routine CT scan of his head, which suggested uh, venous thrombosis, but no evidence of hemorrhage. He was started as per the guidance on IVIG, um, received 0.5 grams per kilo initially, and low dose fondoparanox, which is a non-heparin based therapy. However, overnight, his situation deteriorated. His Glasgow coma scale dropped. He had a further CT scan of his head, which demonstrated a parietal bleed. It was discussed with the neurosurgical team at Queen Square, who suggested conservative management, but also with us. And we had him transferred over to UCLH. So he was intubated and ventilated on arrival, and he was really very unwell. He had a day's worth of multiple seizures while in, in intensive care, and at that time was hemodynamically very, very unstable. So we threw the book at him. So he had 1.5 volume plasma exchange overnight. He had more IVIG afterwards. He had high dose steroids, and that was continued daily. So his bloods with us reconfirmed the low platelet count, but it also demonstrated a low fibrinogen level. So the level of two is very low for someone this sick, with the D-dimer level that was exceptionally raised and the sort of levels one would see typically in patients with cancer. Yeah. He had the other routine labs I've shown you there, but he also had PF antibodies tested and these were very positive. So this is one of his scans. So the following day, he was still fitting. Um, he started, obviously, Kepra for that, but the CTV showed extensive venous sinus thrombosis of all the cerebral venous sinuses with this parietal hemorrhage. He had extended scanning, uh, as we did during that period, as often patients had more than one clot either venous or arterial and indeed he had a small PE but also extensive portal vein thrombosis and this is another picture of his um, head scan so we can see in this second one the sinuses are all clotted and down here here here's the parietal bleed and all this white is thrombosis in his venous sinuses and this very small one over here is cortical vein thrombosis. So as I said he had uh, a lot of therapy. He started anticoagulation with critical dose alcatraban and this was up titrated based on his platelet count. He used a lot of fibrinogen concentrate to correct the low fibrinogen that I've spelled incorrectly methyl pred and daily plasma exchange, as well as IVIG. Now, during this time, it was a very much a multi-team effort. There was a lot of ologies involved with this young man's care. But you can see as a summary from this graph, how his platelet count quickly normalized. And in conjunction with that, the D-dimer fell relatively quickly. And along the bottom are his PF4 levels. So before 60 days after his discharge, it was within the normal range. So what happened to him? Well, he was started on a Pixaban after extubation about a week later, and then start, uh, sent to one of our wards, uh, really to just get over everything that he'd been through. Unfortunately, suffered a post-op fever, which is not unsurprising, and was seen by ophthalmology because of hemorrhagic papilledema and started on acetazolamide. 
He was discharged a couple of weeks later. He had absolutely no gross neurological deficit. He remains completely well. The thromboses have all resolved apart from one small area within his head and he's back to work. He doesn't know what all the fuss is about. Similarly, this is a, a one slide of another young patient who presented with multiple thrombi, including a large anterior myocardial infarction. So this is very relevant. He now has ongoing cardiac needs. It's not going to suddenly get better. He has infarcted a large part of his heart and it was related to vaccination. And he spent a long time on intensive care. So we know about a condition called spontaneous hit. And this has been described really just in case reports in the literature where patients who have not received heparin have developed hit. But in the majority of cases, almost exclusively, it was associated with some sort of procedure, some sort of surgical or interventional procedure. And we also know that within blood bank donors, the presence of anti-PF4 heparin antibodies is not common, but can be detected. So we know about these two particular conditions. But in the middle of March, three groups, as Mike said, simultaneously demonstrated this new syndrome. So we had the data from Norway, Austria, Germany, and the UK. And they are all very, very comparable. What we see is that the patients affected are all young. We've already heard about the male-female distribution. We think it's 50-50. The time from vaccination Again, relatively comparable, so from five days and in this, these cohorts up to 24 days. And as one has more and more patients in the cohorts, we can see an extension of the degree of impact of this new condition. So cerebral vein thrombosis and splanchnic vein thrombosis was ubiquitous between the three groups, but with more cases, we're seeing more thrombosis and arterial events. But also, with more cases, we're seeing the impact of extensive thrombosis, so intracerebral hemorrhage. All patients had a low platelet count, a low uh, fibrinogen, or certainly not fibrinogens that were increased, D-dimers through the roof, and all but one had positive anti-PF4 antibodies. So looking just a little bit more detail at the UK cohort, because I think even at that time, it presented some really, really important information. Firstly, if we look at the assay types, the AccuSTAR is an automated test. We have in our special lab laboratories um, to detect if a patient has hit antibodies. And in all the cases in the initial UK cohort, they were negative. And identifying the antibodies, the anti-PF4 antibodies, was by ELISA confirmed uh, by another test at NHSBT. So that was the first point of what's going on with the assays. And in fact, Sean Patton from the Royal London, um, in conjunction with some other collaborators, have looked in far more detail at a number of assays and we confirmed the sensitivity and specificity. But ELISA-based assays are required for diagnosis of VIT. Secondly, even early on, we could see that patients with a low platelet count had more extensive thrombosis and were more likely to die. And as I've already mentioned, the risk of arterial disease increases. And this is very relevant. So from this initial three cohorts, Already the diagnosis of VIT was established where the timing following the first AstraZeneca vaccine, so at that time it's between five and 28 days, it was associated with this low platelet count, low fibrinogens, excessively raised D-dimers, and the presence of thrombosis, which was felt to be atypical, so mainly in the brain or splanchnic uh, veins. The risk, even at that time, of arterial thrombosis appeared to be 10 to 20 percent 
of all cases. Now, when I mention arterial thrombosis, these is in, as we've said, fit and well young people who had no evidence of underlying arterial risk. So they would present with a stroke, heart attack, or in some cases, peripheral arterial thrombus and some patient requiring amputation of their limbs. The degree of thrombosis was so significant, in some cases we were seeing this secondary hemorrhage. So these anti-PF4 antibodies were positive viralizers and unrelated to patients receiving heparin. And in the initial cohort, the mortality for BIT was 30 to 50 percent, which in the current era for any condition, that's absolutely unacceptable. And the morbidity has yet to be assessed. Now we were seeing some very strange thrombi, and this is um, some examples again of ophthalmic vein thrombosis. I don't recall in my career hearing much about ophthalmic vein thrombosis, but the pertinence of this particular paper that was presented was this was identified along with the thrombocytopenia. The patients were treated for their thrombocytopenia, but a platelet count of 80,000 which normally is absolutely fine, in bit does not cut it. And what happened with this patient? They had a massive stroke. So we need to normalize the platelet count as quickly as possible. And as Mike said, then there were the cases of VIT in, associated, in association with J and J vaccine. So just looking in a bit more detail at the laboratory side of things, we followed treatment pathways as well as HIT because we didn't have really an idea of what we were dealing with. But even within the laboratory early on, um, Andreas Greinick had produced some very important information. So in normal HIT, if we add heparin to the samples, we get increased reaction time, so increased thrombosis. In VIT, we were trying to avoid heparin-based therapy because it's comparable to HIT. But in fact, Andreas showed us that using low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin in the samples reduced the action, reaction time. Whereas you add PF4, the reaction time increases significantly. So finally, in August of this year, we were lucky enough, based on all the fantastic collaboration in the UK, to present a very large cohort of patients with VIT, with definite VIT or likely probable. And we made some imp important findings, um, such that the median time following the first AstraZeneca vaccine was 14 days to presentation. And it was within a very young age group, so the median was 48 years and not necessarily females, males and females equally affected. And if we go back to the initial presentations, it's not dissimilar. So half the cases had CVST, about a third had associated hemorrhage with CVST, so it was so severe. About 20% had this atypical thrombus in the splanchnic vein, and about 20% had arterial thrombus. But more importantly, about 30% of all cases had more than two vascular beds involved. Even during this period, the mortality had decreased to 23%, which again is very significant, but very, very high. But there was a subgroup of patients which were originally demonstrated as poor prognosis, which was confirmed within this large cohort. So if you had a low platelet count, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and intracerebral hemorrhage, your risk of dying was 78%. So the treatment, which I'm not going to go into any more detail, was primarily IVIG, but using plasma exchange in these severe cases, increased survival to 90%. So what about after discharge? What do we need to do? Well, we need to monitor the anti-PF4 antibodies. Relapses have occurred, primarily associated with thrombocytopenia, an increased D-dimers, and often an increase in the anti-PF4 antibodies. But new thrombi have also been identified. And we have a lot yet to learn about these anti-PF4 antibodies and their role in causing VIT 
post-vaccination and the impact in patients in the longer term. So thank you very much for your attention. As always, there's many, many people to thank, in particular our own team at UCH, but also the fabulous expert haematology panel, Brian Craven, who's been collecting all the initial data with us, all of our UK colleagues who, as usual, come together in a fantastic way, as well as the coagulation labs and speciality support. Thank you very much for your attention. Another great talk. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, we'll save questions to the end. Thank you very much. That was really good. Um, so we're going to move on. Sue uh, was in clinic and I hope she is free now. Uh, Sue, are you there? Uh, I suspect she's got caught up with the patient. Shall we just change the order? And uh, Paul, would you mind talking next? Thank oh. you. Fantastic. <laughs> Actually, it's like a jigsaw and we need all four talks to get to the end. So um, Paul, Professor Paul Bennett is going to talk to us about the psychological aspects of FIT. Uh, Paul is really well qualified to talk about this. He's Professor of Clinical Health Psychology at Swansea University uh, and he's worked as a clinical psychologist in the NHS and also an academic. And his real interest is looking at people and how they cope with severe illness. And he's an author and co-authored five books and over 120 publications on the relationship between health and clinical psychology. Um, and then over the last five years, he's focused on how people cope with venous thromboembolism. And he's a strong advocate of psychological care following thrombosis. He's also a trustee of Thrombosis UK. Um, and I think I've said enough. Paul, over to you. Oh, we're really looking forward to this chat. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I hope people can see that screen. I, I think uh, that looks good. Um, <laughs> I have to say, and apologies if it happens, but... Um, <laughs> we're having some work done in the garden and they've decided to make a lot of noise at the moment so hopefully that won't intrude onto the talk um, but um, what I want to talk about yeah psychological impact of it um, and so let's go for it I think first of all you all know this so I'm not going to dwell on this but if you think about the signs and symptoms of VIT or VTE or a range of disorders we have severe headache, visual change, nausea. They're scary. And I think that's the critical thing, that there are very scary things associated with the experience of uh, BTE and VIT. And if you add um, the sort of more medical um, explanations of what's happening underpinning those symptoms, frankly, it gets even more scary. Now, we haven't done a study, or no one's done a study on uh, VIT patients, um, absolutely. So what I'm doing is looking at other similar populations or populations that have gone through similar experiences to look at the likely psychological out, um, experience of people that have had VIT. And I guess that the critical things that we're likely to expect are um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, health anxiety, more global anxiety and depression. I'll come on to some of the other things um, on this slide as well. And what I have here is the sort of prevalence of these different disorders um, in various populations that are relevant to VIT. So as you can see, uh, the prevalence of PTSD um, tends to be around a quarter of people that have had um, a stroke or a myocardial infarction or a PEDVT will have PTSD, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is and why they may get it in a minute. Um, our own data has found that about 40% of people will have clinical levels of health anxiety, and anxiety, more general anxiety and depression, are also highly prevalent in these types of populations. Now, PTSD, if I can just talk about that a little bit. 
because uh, some of you may be unfamiliar, some of you may be more familiar, but it's worth talking about what it is and why it's so problematic and why people may get it. The symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder can be identified as three types. Um, the first is, um, I guess, the one that most people know, which are referred to as flashbacks. These are memories of incidents, and they're usually associated with episodes of high fear. So if you can imagine uh, somebody having a PE, somebody having an myocardial infarction and so forth, those are very scary events. And critically, uh, one of the key issues that really does define whether people are going to get PTSD is whether they believe they are going to die as a result of the symptoms that they're experiencing. And the flashbacks that people get as a result are memories of those events that are associated with that fear. And um, these are uncontrollable. They occur out of the blue. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but they are literally memories of the event. Uh, one, um, if you talk to patients that have had PTSD, they feel as if they are there. It's not they are remembering what happened, but they are reliving what happened. They have the taste, the fear, the, the, the visual, and they cannot kick out of those. And one of the most difficult things is that for some of the neurological underpinnings, of this uh, disorder, these can occur either as a result of cues to trigger memories, but they can also happen when uh, the person is relatively disengaged and not doing very much, not thinking very much, and the brain, uh, the sort of neurological process underpinning it kick in. And that can often happen at night. Uh, so you may, people have, may have nightmares, um, which can take many hours um, to recover from. You know, if you if you have if you can imagine, you know, you're lying there and reliving what feels like a near death episode, it can take a long time to calm down and re-engage. So people can get increasingly tired, and that can shift into issues of depression and so forth. One of the interesting things for me, at least, is that there are also high levels of PTSD following being in intensive care, and one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, often people get untestable, quite difficult nightmares. And people can have um, PTSD flashbacks, not just, not necessarily about their condition per se, but some of those experiences that people have. People often have nightmares because they're under some degree of sedation and not able to reality test, and those become very vivid and people can have um, much frequent recurrence of those nightmares. I worked with one person that was so frightened by them that they couldn't even say what the nature of those um, nightmares was. So these can be very frightening themselves. So you may have these flashbacks about the event itself. You may have uh, flashbacks about the treatment that people are receiving. Um, the other elements of PTSD are um, chronic worry, um, mithering, as um, um, some of my Birmingham colleagues would say, people ruminate about issues, what could have happened, what might have happened. And this can become pro really problematic. Um, I know one guy, for example, that would spend literally probably six to seven hours ruminating about what could have happened, why it didn't happen, why he was let down, and so forth by the care. And um, alongside that, there is a chronically high arousal. These people are on a knife edge. They're um, hyper aroused, likely to get angry, likely to um, become quite difficult to live with. So there's a range of issues that go along with PTSD. Um, it sounds, you know, PTSD, um, it's a condition, but it's very difficult and problematic for those people that have it. And it's likely to be high in people that have had it because you know, the experience of the condition is likely to be very frightening, um, and clearly the treatment can also um, be very frightening. Anxiety and depression, I guess, are much more, um, people are much more aware of and um, don't need so much explanation. 
But one of the things that we have found in VTE populations is that um, the prevalence levels I've got here are um, probably at three months, but they could be at six months, they could be at a year. A lot of these things take a long time um, to sort of reconcile and to um, improve over time. So it can be very useful um, to think about how we treat these people. What I've got underneath that is the plus. And what makes VIT even more probably psychological problematical is that this is something that these people have chosen to, a, a consequence of something that these people have chosen to do. So there's likely to be self-blame, there's likely to be anger at a range of people, the authorities, doctors, and they may well be a lack of trust um, in medical professions and others, not because of their direct experience of those um, you know, uh, meetings, et cetera, but simply because, you know, here I've done something safe and look what's happened to me. So these people are likely to have higher levels of morbidity, psychological morbidity, as a consequence of these events that may make them uh, more difficult and, and make it more difficult to deal um, with the, the problems that they're facing. So what can we do to help these people, which is really what I want to focus on. And obviously, as frontline um, people, um, you are <laughs> you're not going to be doing psychological therapy, but let's have a look. How do these people present? What are the issues? Well, one of the things that often occurs, and we certainly found this in VTE, and there's no reason to assume that it won't happen in VIP patients, is that there's high levels of panic. People that have had um, pulmonary embolism in particular, um, experience what one of the people we talked to in one of our studies called post-thrombotic panic syndrome. They get into a panic at the recurrence of symptoms, and that's likely to be something that's going along in the bit. Um, the PTSD I've talked about, and along with that may well be many intrusive worries, intrusive thoughts, some of them may be anger, some of them may be future-oriented, but there will be a lot of um, impact on people's quality of life and mood as a consequence of these intrusive worries and concerns. And this may be added to, as I say, um, by um, feelings of anger, um, lack of trust and so forth. And that may obviously be psychologically treated. These may be, if you like, diagnosable conditions, but they also may make for difficult medical interactions um, it's interesting uh, that Professor Scully uh, said that the uh, young man that he saw said, oh, what's the fuss all about, which rather goes against some of these issues. But I think on the whole, people are going to, um, you know, find it difficult to deal with. And some of this may be expressed, not directed at clinicians directly, but that these may be um, expressed in uh, interactions with medics. So I think it's worth thinking about how we can treat these psychologically, but how you perhaps as frontline people can manage some of these issues um, in your medical interactions where they may rise to the surface and come, become problematic. Not in the acute phase, but in the longer term you know, when you're following these people up. And this is a, a, the LENS framework, which was developed by um, uh, my colleague, Rachel Hunter, but it's sort of based on um, you know, sound principles of working with people. And what she's basically arguing, what I would like to argue, is that essentially what we have to do is respect these people's anger, respect these people's feelings, and just allow them to talk. We don't have to provide solutions necessarily. We don't have to come up with, why don't you do this, or how's about that, or, or even defense. What about this? What about that? It is basically some time spent listening and empathizing and accepting and normalizing that anger and fear are actually perfectly normal reactions. So that I, I remember one years ago, we did a, a slightly different um, population, but we were working in women going through cancer genetic screening. And we developed a self-help intervention for those women. And um, we, were develop, we were giving them strategies to help deal with anxiety because they were going through quite an anxious period in their lives. And the handout we gave had something along the lines of, 
not everyone experiences an anxiety at this time. Many people do. If that's you, then this will be maybe of use. And one of the people that we did some focus groups said that that sentence where we said this is a perfectly normal reaction was the most helpful thing that they experienced. Not our psychological sophisticated intervention, but simply being you know, given information that normalized their experience. This is a reasonable thing to do. So it can be difficult. Um, and I think one of the things I think that um, medics, nurses, and the whole health professionals want to do is to provide solutions to, um, to tell people what to do. And it can be quite difficult just to listen and accept uh, and not provide those solutions. If there are solutions, they can be given, but sometimes it is a matter of just accepting that people feel pretty pissed off. What else can we do? Well, obviously, if people have diagnosable um, psychological problems, then these people need, I think, to get psychological help or medical help, psychiatric. And obviously, the critical thing is to refer to clinical service, uh, clinical psychology services. I'm a psychologist. I would say that, wouldn't I? Or other mental health services, you know, psychiatry and so on and so forth. So that's an obvious thing to do. Um, Less obvious maybe, except for you're on this, uh, at this seminar, so you're probably more aware of this than most, but Thrombosis UK um, has a range of self-help materials, um, some patient support, and maybe in the future, maybe looking at developing a more um, therapeutically based um, uh, support network, but that, that's for the future. Um, so I think the critical thing in terms of if people have mental health issues, is to refer on. It's not for um, medical people to be treating. It's an interesting issue. I mean, one of the things, if you want to do this psychometrically, you know, this person, you know, a lot of judgments made about whether people need psychological help are based on, um, you know, simply intuition. This person is distressed. They're talking about these symptoms. And to me, that's fine. If I was a clinical psychologist getting a referral that said this person is upset, distressed, appears to have PTSD, that will be fine. But sometimes people like um, criteria, you know, if people achieve some sort of mental health criteria. And it's a dreadful measure in terms of what it measures in some ways. Um, but the and psychometrically, it's terrible. But the hospital anxiety and depression scale, some of you may well have come across it is a very simple and very good screening instrument. There are others around, I'm not going to um, suggest this is the only one, but there are measures that we can use. And certainly in some uh, referral systems, um, the NICE, for example, recommend use of the HADS. And I would like to suggest also, there's something called the impact of event scale, um, which is a measure of worry. It's those intrusive thoughts um, that I was talking about earlier. Um, that may be of use um, if people want to sort of put, put some numbers to the issues, because both of them have cutoffs above which the person will be identified as needing and benefiting from psychological psychiatric support. Within Thrombosis UK, um, there is a range of self-help leaflets that are based on, um, they're sort of cut down simplified versions of um, the types of therapy that people may um, get if they got a more um, live or interactive therapeutic process. So there are strategies for dealing with worries, intrusive thoughts, which I've talked about quite a bit as being something uh, central to PTSD. It's central to health anxiety, uh, may even be central to depression, so types of depression that are based on intrusive worries that, that, that drag the person down. So we have some... Um, um, ideas about how to deal with those um, using active distraction, using meditation, mindfulness, some of the more modern ways that I think people have found very useful. We've got work on what we call post-thrombotic panic syndrome, a cognitive behavioral strategy um, for um, helping people manage panic um, and general relaxation, helping people sleep. If you were to go and see a therapist, I won't bore you with the details too much, but there are, there are a range of therapies, um, trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy, um, panic-based uh, 
CBT, et cetera, et cetera. But those are, for, I think, for the experts. But there are routes in that people can be given support while they're waiting, the inevitable wait um, for long-term services that um, people may be um, likely to um, benefit from. So to conclude, people that have had VIT um, or similar um, are, likely, are at high risk of experiencing a number of psychological, adverse psychological consequences. It may not be for people in the frontline medical care to provide treatment for them, it certainly isn't, but maybe there should be some understanding, some engagement with them and be prepared to uh, send on to secondary or other services. That inevitably takes a fair amount of time. So why not use some of our psychological strategies that are available on the thrombosis website um, that may help people either so they don't need um, that help or it will give them some immediate support while they're waiting for that support. We also have patient um, experts within uh, Thrombosis UK that people can contact directly that may also be of benefit. So there's a number of support ways um, that we, we can provide for these people. Wow, a quick run through. Hope that wasn't too quick. Hope it was sensible and made sense. And uh, I'll hand you back to Professor Beverly Hunt, OBE. I'm the only first person without an OBE to talk today. That is very disappointing. No, you're not. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. And I think those words were amazing. Uh, they help us with all patients with VT, not just with FIT. So thank you for that. No doubt there'll be questions later. Uh, I'm going to move on to now to the last speaker, Dr. Sue Pavard, uh, and she's going to talk about treatment and follow up of FIT. Uh, Sue is also so well known. She's a consultant hematologist at Oxford. Uh, and she's also an Associate Senior Lecturer in Medicine at St Edmunds Hall in Oxford. Her special areas of interest are immunohematology, hemostasis, thrombosis and obstetric hematology. Uh, and she's really been the key player in the management of VIT in the UK, having led uh, as chair of the expert hematology panel uh, focusing on VIT. So, I'm going to stop talking about how wonderful she is. I think we all know that and let her talk to us. So over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Beverly. And thank you to Thrombosis UK. Um, I'd need to ask Paul to stop sharing his screen so that I can share mine. Okay, can everybody see that? So um, I'm going to talk about the treatment and follow up of VIT. Um, you've heard already from Mike and Marie about the clinical and laboratory features. So it occurs five to 30 days post vaccine. It's not, it's not earlier than that because it takes five days for the immune reaction to occur. There's thrombosis and thrombocytopenia as in the title of the, the condition in the name of the condition and significant activation of the coagulation system with very, very raised D-dimers, inappropriately low fibrinogen and the presence of antiplatelet factor four antibodies. So with this in mind, we, uh, we wanted to help shape the public message and we worked with Public Health England to do that. Having done that, we wanted to support worried vaccine recipients um, but, and certainly not miss any cases, but not inundate emergency departments and primary care um, with very worried patients. So we worked together with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine and their president, Catherine Henderson. And this is a guideline that we came up with for anybody presenting to the emergency departments, that they would be screened out based on the timing post-vaccine. So anybody who presented with these atypical severe symptoms before five days of um, after vaccine could be ruled out as not being fit. If it was within five to 30 days um, or even up to 42 days, if it was isolated VTE, then VIT was suspected, but in 95% of cases could be ruled out on the basis of a normal platelet count. About 5% of people will present with a normal platelet count that subsequently falls. So 
If they're allowed home on the basis of a normal platelet count, there is this safety net to bring them back if their symptoms persist. And that way we felt confident that we were not going to miss any cases, but not inundating the ED departments. Another very important uh, guideline that uh, we collaborated on um, was with the neuro um, uh, community. So the um, Neuro Anesthesia and Critical Care Society, the British Society of Neurosurgeons, and the Association of British Neurologists and the Intensive Care Society. And together we came up with this um, guideline, which essentially says that if people present with significant um, features of it, so very low platelets and, or, or low platelets, they don't have to be very low, and the presence of uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, then they need to get straight to an emergency um, department where there is neuroscience um, support because these patients can deteriorate very quickly so they need to be on site where there is specialist neurological services. Now this case definition criteria you've heard um, already from Mike and Marie about um, but they're really important to guide management as well as to identify cases so that, so that we are uh, we, you know, we know exactly the incidence if we're using this case definition criteria, but they help us guide management. And we look at these five key features, the onset of symptoms five to 30 days post vaccine, the presence of thromboembolism, the presence of thrombocytopenia, very raised D-dimers, and the presence of antiplatelet factor four antibodies by ELISA. A definite case of VIT would meet all criteria. A probable case of VIT would meet four of these criteria and a possible would meet three of those criteria and then unlikely VIT would be um, only two criteria or an, a likely alternative cause. So using this case definition criteria it's really important to help us uh, to guide management. So the mainstay of treatment is intravenous immunoglobulin. So it has an anti-idiotypic response and, and will neutralize circulating antibody. Um, but this um, lovely picture here from Nature Reviews shows its other very important um, activities. So it blocks cellular receptors, it neutralizes not only autoantibodies, but cytokines and complements. It blocks the activated um, FC gamma receptor and saturation of the neonatal FC receptor. And what's so important in VIT is this competitive inhibition of um, the action of the platelet factor 4 antibodies on the FC gamma 2A receptor. So these, um, this is a, an early publication of the use of IVIG in New England Journal of Medicine by the Canadian team in, uh, due, in the summer of, of this year. And they um, looked at three patients and, and they were giving two grams per kilogram of IVIG spread over two days. So they were giving quite high doses, whereas in the UK, we just use one, one gram per kilogram. And you can see that when intravenous immunoglobulin was given, there was a rise in the platelet count. Um, and again, in each of those cases. So the, the first case um, was a 72 year old woman who had uh, acute limb ischemia. The next case was a 63 year old man with um, arterial limb ischemia again. Um, and then the third one of a 69 year old man who had a stroke. And also, also they all had other uh, thrombotic uh, conditions. So you've heard already that there can be multiple vascular beds that have been involved. So these have multiple sites. And, um, and each time they were given immunoglobulin, their platelet count rose, and there was also depression of their D-dimers. So looking at the um, in vitro tests from these patients, they had variable responses to heparin, but if we look at the platelet activation as measured by serotonin release, um, the the um, filled dots are pre-IVIG, and you can see that once IVIG is given, there is suppression of that platelet activation induced by the patient's serum. 
So what about anticoagulants? Well, we do recommend non-heparin based anticoagulants. And this is uh, really based on um, the concern about potential confusion with diagnosis of a potential hit or cross reactivity. So we've, we've used non-heparin based anticoagulants for these patients. And the choice of anticoagulant really depends on the clinical status of the patient and the need for potentially having to stop the anticoagulant for an invasive procedure or a particularly high risk of bleeding. Um, so our Gatraban will be the one that we use for intravenous anticoagulation, and, and you heard about that from Will Lester a few days ago. The um, DOACs have been really helpful and really important in the management of this condition and, and Fondaparinox too. The dose, um, we would give therapeutic anticoagulation wherever possible, even in the previt cases that you've heard from Mike Macris, or, or those with headache syndrome, where thrombosis hasn't yet been confirmed, but they are so procoagulant, these patients, that therapeutic anticoagulation is important. The only um, time we might want to start with lower doses, and this is very controversial, is if there is a significant bleeding risk, there's intracranial hemorrhage and very low platelets, where we're concerned about expansion of the intracranial hemorrhage. And in those cases, we have started with the critical care dose of Argatraban. But one might argue against that in that these cases are the worst cases, they are the most severe and they're highly procoagulant. And the intracranial hemorrhage is secondary to venous occlusion and back pressure. Um, so we really need to clear that cerebral venous sinus thrombus. So what about heparins? So there were early reports of, of clinical worsening of disease and including death. Um, concern about diagnostic uncertainty and, and confusing it with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and potential cross-reactivity. But it does seem that the antiplatelet factor 4 antibodies in VIT are directed to a different epitope in HIT, as in HIT. Um, so with increasing understanding of the pathophysiology of VIT, heparins um, are perhaps being considered as reasonable anticoagulants of choice. And of our 220 UK patients, 25% of them had had heparin at some point, you, um, often before they realized that this was a potential case of VIT or looking at the retrospective cases that had presented in February and early March before we were aware of VIT as a syndrome. So 25% had had heparin at some point and all the clinicians of those cases said that they felt subjectively that heparin had not appeared to be harmful. And when we um, looked at the data on those, those who had received heparin had a 20% mortality compared with 16% of those who hadn't had heparin and had had non-heparin based anticoagulants. And so we, we think it's probably a reasonable anticoagulant to use. And this is perhaps supported by some in vitro studies. Um, these are our tests that are done in, the, in Bristol NHSBT. And you can see that when you incubate a VIT patient um, uh, serum with uh, normal platelet fat four and normal platelets, there will be intense um, activation of platelets as measured here by an exin 5. If we add a small amount of heparin to that, um, then the actual activation is slightly less. Um, and then if we add massive doses of heparin, then we can inhibit that activation as we do with HIT as well. Marie's alluded to plasma exchange and of our 220 patients of a definite and probable VIT that we analyzed, 17, 8% had had plasma exchange for severe disease. And the survival in these patients was 90%. And this compares with 59% in patients with similar phenotypes who had received standard care. So we do encourage early use of plasma exchange in patients with severe phenotypes. And this uh, letter of correspondence to the New England Journal 
um, has also supported the value of plasma exchange in both increasing the platelet count and reducing the D-dimers in these three patients who had had persistent thrombocytopenia and ongoing thrombosis in the presence of intravenous immunoglobulin and anticoagulation. So our analysis was of um, 294 cases referred to our, um, our expert hematology panel daily multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, where the UK haematologists would present their cases and we would, we would collaborate and discuss a consensus management for each case. So we analysed all these referrals. Um, and of those, there were 252 cases who could be classified by our USPD score, the one I, I showed you, that case definition criteria. And we found 176 definite cases where they had all five clinical and laboratory features and 44 probable ones. And we went on to analyze those in more depth. And we looked at the prognostic markers and we showed that if there was cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, the odds of death was 2.7. For a low platelet count, there was a 1.7 increase risk of death for every 50% reduction in the presenting platelet count. Raised D-dimers, there was a 1.2-fold increased risk of death for every 10,000 increase in fibrinogen equivalent units of D-dimer at presentation. And low fibrinogen, a 1.7-fold increased risk of death for every 50% reduction in baseline fibrinogen. Multivariate analysis identified the baseline platelet count and the presence of intracranial hemorrhage as being independently associated with death. Now, intracranial hemorrhage is secondary to CVST. And as Marie told you earlier, in the if there is CVST and a platelet count of less than 30, the death rate was extremely high, over 70% compared with CVST in a platelet count more than 30, when it was 17%, still high, but not nearly as high as that. And the um, FAPIC score um, has been uh, published by, by this group in the European Heart Journal, which actually has picked up very similar um, criteria. Um, I think there's been a little bit of confusion in their paper with TTS, as Mike told you in the first lecture, a thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. But nevertheless, nevertheless uh, they have found very similar uh, features that mark out the poor prognostic score. So very low fibrinogen, young age, very low platelet count, the presence of intracranial hemorrhage and CVST. And this needs more uh, validation, but certainly supports our work. So um, following our, our prognostic uh, markers and identification of poor prognostic patients, we um, modified our treatment recommendations um, to include early plasma exchange in those who have a low plate account of less than 30 and the presence of CVST. So certainly for the definite and probable cases and for the possible cases as well. Um, and then other patients, if they don't have these very severe prognostic features, then to persist with the intravenous immunoglobulin and oral or, or subcutaneous or intravenous and anticoagulation. So other treatments to consider, um, and particularly in low and middle income countries where they may not have access so easily to intravenous immunoglobulin, because we in the UK did have um, a, a very concerning shortage and NHS England were extremely helpful in prioritizing VIT patients for use of IVIG um, and encouraged all pharmacists in the, in the hospitals to process the IVIG immediately if it was required for a case of suspected VIT. So that was fantastic and, and no doubt life-saving. But in, in areas where IVIG is not available, then um, steroids should be used. Um, and, uh, um, and then we, we looked at um, platelet transfusion. Ideally, platelets should not be given 
um, because they can worsen the um, procoagulant activity of this condition. But if patients are about to have neurosurgery, then the neurosurgeons will want a higher platelet count. So in those situations, a platelet transfusion has been necessary. And similarly, a fibrinogen uh, replacement, either with cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate to cover neurosurgery. In the follow-up for either refractory or relapse cases, we have used rituximab on occasional patients and mycophenolate in a handful of cases, um, and that has been uh, effective in um, preventing um, further thrombocytopenia in patients who, who were um, kept having recurrent thrombocytopenia post-discharge. What's the role of aspirin? Well, we certainly don't advocate it as a preventative measure um, in VIT for vaccine recipients um, and not in the early stages because of the high risk of bleeding and the preferential management of proper anticoagulants. But where um, the platelet count has now returned to normal and there was arterial thrombosis, then it's reasonable to add in aspirin to help prevent further ischemic events. The duration of anticoagulation is important and we do advocate for at least three months post vaccine, uh, post discharge um, and making sure that everything is normal before stopping anticoagulation. So D-dimes return to normal, platelet count has returned to normal and at least three months has passed. So this graph comes from um, Andreas Greinacher's study, um, which is very helpful, and it shows the follow-up of antiplatelet factor four antibodies in VIT. And they, as we have seen, they do persist by ELISA, but their pathogenicity declines, and 90% of the pathogenic antiplatelet factor four antibodies have disappeared by 12 weeks. So it's very important at discharge that patients receive information um, or, or before discharge while they're in hospital. Um, and, and this information leaflet has been um, devised by us and it's available on the VSH website. Monitoring for relapse needs to be very close with ongoing antiplatelet factor four antibody measurements and looking for thrombocytopenia and persistently raised D-dimers. There has been at least one case of new thrombosis and new therapies need to be investigated. We don't have a new case of, of VIT in the UK. We haven't seen one for several weeks now since the vaccine rollout stopped for the under 40s and everyone else above that had received their vaccine. So we haven't seen a new case now for several weeks. Social and psychological support is absolutely crucial for these patients. And you've heard about that from Paul, how important that is. And we have also um, given some signposting of where patients can seek help, um, both from their local centers and from national bodies. Um, and of course, we recommend avoidance of the second dose of AstraZeneca vaccine in these patients, but we would promote the second dose of vaccine being with Pfizer. Thank you very much for your attention. And similarly to Marie, I would like to thank my colleagues on the hematology panel. Brian Craven for his data collection, the UK haematologists who worked incredibly hard to manage these cases and share them with our daily meetings. The coagulation laboratories who set up specifically to be able to measure these platelet factor four antibodies by ELISA because they were different from the hit ones and all the uh, Royal Colleges and special societies who we've worked with and our international collaborators. So thank you very much. Excellent, Sue, as, as we'd expect. Um, I, if everybody would like on the panel would like to show themselves again, uh, I know that there are some questions in the chat uh, and I'm going to uh, go through them. There is actually somebody who, I don't know who they are, who's got a case uh, of an extending proximal DVT. And I, I, I think 
because of patient confidentiality, as someone else has pointed out, probably better if they email one of us. Uh, and if they think it's a, a VIT, we still are running the VIT meetings and we have one at two o'clock on Monday, don't we, Sue? Yes, we do. Yeah. In every, there, week, or, every week. Yeah, or they, they could email one of us if they want help. Uh, first question is for Mike. I think it's somebody who probably joined late uh, saying VIT was reported after AZ and Pfizer. How much is the difference between both from their frequency and site of occurrence? So Mike, would you like to re-emphasize your data? Yeah, the uh, MHRA says there have been uh, case 18 cases after Pfizer and two cases after Moderna. However, they are TTS cases and not all of them true VIT. In terms of true VIT with the mRNA vaccines, there is one case with the Moderna published, but even that one, there is a lot of um, discussion whether it's true VIT. In the UK, there have been three cases that we know that were anti player factor four positive, uh, but they were Interestingly, even in those, they were quite unusual in that the presentations were more delayed than we've seen previously. So in terms, does it occur with the mRNA vaccines? I think the jury is still open there, really, whether it happens at all. I think most of the cases are with first AstraZeneca vaccine. And you cannot compare the presentation. It seems they may not occur. Very clear. Um, so. We've got a good question for Sue and Marie. How long do you treat thrombosis uh, due to VIT? Well, I'm happy to start with that. We must remember the vast majority of patients had extensive atypical thrombosis affecting the brain and the splanchnic region. So typically splanchnic thrombosis is lifelong in many other conditions. Um, I keep going. I do scan patients um, to make sure that there's some level of resolution. The brain is going to take longer. I normally forget the guidelines for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis go for a year, even if there's a period of prophylaxis. I think it's, you know, a very critical area. It's a big thrombotic burden in anyone, never mind fit patients. So um, at least six months therapeutically, but keep going for a year with some prophylaxis. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, the, the point is the minimum must be three months and D-dime is normal, platelets normal. Um, so whatever comes later, that's the minimum. The duration is so individual it's so individual that uh, you know I would I would agree with what Marie said for those severe cases. Right, so we've only been following cases for seven months so we don't really have an idea of the average duration of the antiplatelet factor four antibodies yet do we? Anybody want to um, hazard a guess how long they will the average will be? So uh, Brian, Brian has collected some information which we need to share with everyone. We're just fine tuning the paper, the median, but it hasn't completed follow up, as you said, is 84 days. But there is a difference depending on the assay you use. So the Stego versus Immunical give you different results. It seems to be more uh, uh, continuous with the Immunical immunocord based assays, but the median is about 84 days, which is not out of spontaneous or standard hit. Um, and there have been some cases that have relapsed uh, during follow up. Do you want to say any more about those cases? Marie, you in particular uh, were managing them. Um, so thankfully, there were a minimum of patients who had progressive thrombosis associated with relapse. Invariably, it was a drop in the platelet count, increased D-dimer, and actually probably an increase in the PF4 levels. And going back to Mike's pre-VIT, let's call it, call it that, um, what we didn't want was to see progressive thrombi, which was a massive risk. That platelet count had to be normal. So it's a very small percentage of patients. Uh, but I think the reason that we're not seeing more is because 
they were intensively treated in the UK from identification of disease, but it's about 10% of all cases. I think that's correct, Sue, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, the one other point probably to make in relation to that is that the, the relapses were all early. They were, they, we're not getting any relapses now. They all occurred uh, very early. And one other issue is whether it related to the half-life of the immunoglobulin that was given. And as the immunoglobulin was wearing off after sort of three to four weeks, that's when the thrombostopenia appeared to recur in some patients. Okay, perfect. Um, and then there's a question, vitamin K antagonists or DOAC for CVST? Well, um, it would be our preference to use a DOAC. The concern about vitamin K antagonists is the initial hypercoagulability that occurs due to the fall in protein C and protein S before the full anticoagulant effect has, has happened. So, um, you know, we had very good success with uh, DOAC, so that would be our preference. Okay. Would you su suggest increased monitoring when patients have their second booster or dose? I think the patients would want increased monitoring. Um, so it, it, it's so yeah. I mean, if, even if it's just for psychological support for them, of course they would want that. And um, but but we have no no patients yet who have had a relapse of it following their second dose. There have been about forty of our two hundred and twenty cases who have ha gone on to have a second vaccine. One case of Catherine Baggett's, in fact, um, announced to her in clinic one day, "Oh, I've just had my second AstraZeneca." So her her sort of heart dropped into her shoes. But um, in fact, that patient had no problems. Um, but we would certainly offer them uh, more monitoring. Okay, and then this is one that is really good. So uh, women affected by VIT and, and get treated and they recover. Is there any recommendation to advocate antenatal thromboprophylaxis should they get pregnant in future? Well, we're unable to make any recommendation on that. And, and this would be a, a very provoked thrombosis and it should be seen as such and so it really depends where in relation to their VIT they then get pregnant because if it's sort of within six months and I think you would give them antenatal prophylaxis because they've still got venous healing if you like or, or, or arterial and um, but if it's sometime in the future five years and they they would be considered in a normal way for anti antenatal prophylaxis that we did for would for anybody with provoked thrombosis. Marie? So sort of just shaking your head. Yeah, um, I probably wouldn't wouldn't take that stance a number of years down the line. This is out of the blue, crazy new syndrome in well people. And as quickly as the thrombi develop with treatment, they resolve very quickly. So my expectation is that it's just there. It's not like fact fired Leiden or some other thrombotic recurrent positive family history or in the patient this is a different ball game I don't think I would put them at increased risk unless there was another obstetric reason yeah I, I would support that view I mean I think the key thing is this, this it's is unknown unique. it's an unknown yeah. entity isn't it <laughs> yeah it, it's unique and the, and the point is what Marie is saying is it's this is an immune reaction it's not just primary prothrombotic Okay, I'm going to bring Paul to the conversation because, Paul, what you probably are hearing is that there's a lot of uncertainty among the medics. And the poor patients are having not only to do with something horrific that's come out of the blue, but they've got doctors looking after them where we haven't got all the answers. That must add to the poor patient's anxiety. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, I think... Um... That's a very interesting question. Thank you for identifying it as an issue. I think if you look at how we treat anxiety, if you, if you think about how we treat something like a phobia, you expose the person to the spider, the spider doesn't do anything dreadful, and they go, oh, thank goodness, I'm, the spiders are not bad. Um, but, but when you have a future-oriented anxiety, you can't have that reassurance because you cannot 
you know, you may not have an illness today, but you may have it tomorrow or you may have it the day after. So you're not able to give yourself um, that sort of reassurance from experience because experience doesn't do the trick. So future oriented health related anxiety, I think is very difficult to deal with. And um, one of the things that I think with, if you can call them ordinary uh, VTE issues is that people have that fear of a future VTE. When you've had something like VIT and you're not sure what's gonna happen in the future, that is quite a difficult thing to deal with. Now, there are strategies we can use for that, um, you know, and it depends on the person that you're working with, whether it is simple distraction, whether it's learning to manage uncertainty or whatever, um, but it certainly is um, quite an issue for people to deal with. But, yeah. And that's why we all feel that this group of patients should have special support if they need it. And Sue's been absolutely amazing uh, in pulling in uh, psychiatric help and uh, psychiatrists, but there aren't enough of them around. So uh, Paul is helping us lead with Thrombosis UK uh, some extra support. Uh, and there is actually, uh, we're trying to crowdfund and raise money for that. It's called the Regain Project. It's on the uh, Thrombosis UK website, if anyone is feeling very generous today. <laughs> okay, one more question, and then we have to stop because I think everyone else has other things to do. It's really that question about when do you stop anticoagulation? Should you test for antiplatelet factor for antibodies? Should you wait for everything to be negative before you stop anticoagulation? Who wants to take that? Well, I think it's going to be a difficult call. We definitely need routine laboratory parameters to be normal. Um, but the PF4 is an unknown entity. And as I've already mentioned, it does depend on the assay. Sue's shown you the difference between the ELISA and platelet activation assay. So I think still we need more information on that. But I think a good course, depending on the site of thrombosis, in conjunction with routine laboratory parameters that are completely normal and have been for some time, and perhaps even a decrease in the PA4 is probably acceptable, but in discussion with patients. Sue, so, what would you say? I, I, I would wait for the antibody to be negative personally. Uh, these patients have been th through such a lot, haven't they? anticoagulants these days they're so easy to manage aren't they with DOAX that it, it really changes the risk benefit balance from the old days when we were using warfarin so um, it, 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 it seems a reasonable approach but but you know the point is um, I, I think Marie's right there is a difference between the presence of platelet factor 4 antibodies by ELISA and the pathogenicity of them but in the UK we we use ELISA as our mainstay of tests so it's reasonable to wait till they've disappeared. Okay, uh, I'm going to bring it to a close now. Uh, I want to thank the audience. Uh, they've stuck it out. In fact, the audience got bigger and bigger uh, as we've gone along. Thank you for the amazing talks, all of you. You're all stars. And uh, I hope maybe we can do VIT again next year and the story will be very, very different next World Thrombosis Day. So thank you all for all your hard work in this area. Please, if you feel generous, please look on the Thrombosis UK website and help us with our crowdfunding to uh, improve psychological support to these patients with FIT. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>